program you realized already that we had a welcome note missing, which is from the coordinator of QNano. The reason is that Kenneth Dawson was unfortunately on Sunday in an accident and was stuck, uh, if I understand right, the car got fire, he got some burns, but he looked horrible when he joined us by video conference on Monday. I see he's again uh, smiling and happy, but he was unable to travel, but fortunately to the technique, he's now here with us online and uh, ready to give the talk, the keynote, the second keynote lecture. And Kenneth, without any more ado, um, you have the word. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. That's good. Okay, so as you can see, I'm uh, not as burned as, as, as you might expect. So it's a fairly minor injury to my leg, but it still makes me relatively immobile. So this is really a wonderful opportunity to be able to keep going um, the conference without me actually having to be there. Um, if we look at the title slide, uh, I believe Chris is going to change the slides for me. So if anything becomes misaligned, he'll let us know, or he'll let me know. But basically, um, in the first slide, there's a question. But actually, much of what I want to say in this talk, it's not really a scientific talk or research talk in the usual sense. It's to sort of talk about our field in a more general sense. And I detect a wind of change. Um, in the last nano safety cluster, but one, that's not the one that you attended yesterday possibly, but the one before, the conversation talked to excellence. It turned to the topic of research excellence. And that, in fact, is the first time that I've heard the community begin to use, use those words. And so the question is whether nano safety research um, will emerge in its maturity, uh, in, as it matures, into a real platform of research excellence globally. Now, it would not be surprising if at least Europeans wished that to be so. It would be quite natural. Um, the reason, of course, is that rightly or wrongly, Europeans are very conservative um, about safety, uh, probably more so than many other parts of the world. And therefore, it's a topic that's very close to them, close to us. It's therefore, in some sense, natural that if we're going to engage with this topic, that a topic that's so close to our hearts, safety and nano-safety in this context, that we should ultimately seek and perhaps grow it into something that is truly scientifically excellent. In the next slide, too, however, there is what we call in English language the fly in the ointment. Now, you'll understand that some of the things that I have to say involve very different views of many different people. Um, and I don't always, I won't always tell you which view I personally sit in, uh, but I will say that if you look at this month's Nature Nano technology magazine, journal, um, you'll see a debate on the quality of nano safety research. And that debate has sort of gone on over several editorials, several letters, with, I suppose, the underlying theme uh, a little bit, that there's something that needs to be done by the nano safety community for it to establish its credentials more clearly. Um, that's a dialogue, by the way. I, I think it would be valuable if, if as the slide suggests, um, and the journal suggests, we, we can join this dialogue um, and make our own view 
others felt. But um, I think most of us accept that there are some concerns about the, the, the status of nano safety research as it began. Now, this in itself, I hasten to add, is not surprising. If you actually take a step back, which I think is very important for everyone to do, that's um, scientists, regulators, policy makers, funding stakeholders. If you take a step back, what we've achieved in a short time is remarkable. We've come together from the four corners of research, so to speak, and begun to make a new field. Uh, we didn't start with a shared language. We certainly didn't start with a shared vision. And those of you that do attend the Nano Safety Cluster, which I strongly recommend, you will see a remarkable growth of convergence in attitude and view. So I, I think we've actually achieved a lot, but it would be wrong to say that we have uh, we've reached this status of excellence. But I think now is the time to talk about that word because it's come up and I'm pretty sure that that's what Europe is expecting from us and I'm pretty sure that that's what is feasible globally. If we go to the next slide, um, I just want to make a remark, slide three. I mean, uh, I think what we have to really capture it's just how different cell nanoparticle interactions are from those of small molecules. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I think this question about mechanisms of action being very different um, underlies part of our problems to date and some of the controversies that have gone on in the literature uh, so far. If you turn to the next slide, You will see green 40 nanometer, as it happens, polystyrene nanoparticles inside a living cell, where the red things are lysosomes. This is uh, 30 minutes after the particles have been exposed to the cells. And I'm showing you this slide and the next one to make a very specific. So, if we now turn, uh, as most of you will know, of course, the lysosomes, the red labeled objects, are, are the bins of the cell. If you now turn to the next one, four hours later, you'll see that the red particles, sorry, the green particles have all vanished. And you'll see that those orange objects that you saw are formed by an overlap of the green particles with the red lysosomes. And it's a, it's a very simple point, but the point is this, that uh, those particles were trafficking to the lysosomes. Now, that is not what happens in small molecules. And if you turn to the next slide, there's a very simple set of two pictures that I think uh, all of our students have seen, and I'd recommend that you show something like this to every student that comes to your lab. Simplifying this somewhat, the left uh, picture is a cell that has been exposed to um, a fluorescent dye associated with, especially composed uh, into nanoparticles. And on the right is the identical dye exposed as a molecular dye. Now you'll see on the left that the green is punctit, and on the green and the right, the dye is everywhere. Actually, ultimately, it'll associate to different organelles in all sorts of complicated ways. But what you're seeing is the same chemical structure acting in an utterly different way, simply dependent on the size of the object. And actually, that is the same picture de facto that you saw in the movies. Because on the left hand of the picture, those punctate green spots that you see here are actually lysosomes. And it's the same picture as the thing that you saw with the orange, which is the green inside the, the red lysosomes where they were dyed. 
So the key point is that nanoparticles can interact with cells in new ways. Um, and unlike small molecules that interact um, by more conventional physiochemical distribution processes, what we have here are active biological transport. Now, if we go to slide seven, what we've just talked about is, is a very important example of how different things are when we're dealing with particles rather than small molecules. And so one of the points I want to make is that some of the practices that we have introduced into our community, sometimes without um, extensive evaluation, um, need to be reconsidered because those practices were designed for small molecules. They were not designed for nanoparticles. And so there are two areas I want to talk around. One is the positive controls, issues of positive controls, and the other is connected to dispersion media. These are not um, the only issues, but they're illustrative. And if you go to the next slide, I'm putting the question, to some of the issues that, we, so that we're talking about impact on the reproducibility of our science. If you then skip quickly past slide nine, which is again this question of reproducibility and so forth, and go to slide 10, you'll see an example of a round robin um, Test, set of tests on particles that induce cell death, technically apoptosis. Um, this is part of a little round robin, early stages of development of a round robin led by Inga, who's probably in the room. And you'll see that these are the results from many different very good laboratories. These tests were carried out with a reasonably good SOP. And you can see that with identical particles and identical everything else, the spread of results that have been obtained. Um, now, there is always a tendency um, when we face results like this to respond in different ways. And one of the things, I'd just like to spend a few words on, on how we should react to these results. In some cases, essentially, um, there's a difference of 50% in, in, the, in the numbers of cells that cell die between different laboratories. Um, what we must emphasize is that these are all good laboratories. We must also emphasize that um, that the SOP here, the sort of uh, directions or guidance that the laboratories were given, can certainly still be tightened up a lot. But already, it's much, much stronger than the description that is given in typical experimental, news, uh, experimental papers. I'll just pause and let you reflect for a moment on that. So the kinds of experiments that we're doing and reporting at the literature, in the literature at the minute, typically um, involve less defined controls than the ones carried out here. So of course it would be possible to continue and refine and refine the controls at some length, but the key point I want to make is that we are reporting essentially results of this type in the literature. Um, and you can see the typical spread from lab to lab. It's therefore not surprising that there could be different outcomes reported by people. Um, if you go to the next slide, I want to explore for a little, a little bit the kinds of of reasons that cause differences 
in how we in what we report. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to discuss is this idea that it comes as a little bit of a surprise at first, um, or it did, I think going back several years ago. Cell nanoparticle interactions depend on their context in quite a different way than molecules. So we are accustomed to essentially dissolving small molecules and doing in vitro uh, biological and toxicological experiments with them. But in this case, if you go to the next slide, slide 12, one of the things that we've worked on, um, if you see this nanoparticle is actually covered by um, lots of different biomolecules that it has absorbed from the environment. And um, we've now come to the relatively clear conclusion that the way that nanoparticles interact with um, cells, biological barriers and so forth, is in large measure a consequence of what is absorbed onto them and not only their size or shape. Now, I, I hasten to add, of course, that what is absorbed onto them is a consequence of the material and their size and shape. But you see this phenomenon where the context now becomes part of the experiment. Succinctly put, if you disperse the particles in a particular dispersant, you have given it a context that will affect the outcome. If you choose to use 10% of uh, serum derived from a cow with human cells, you have made a very specific choice. And it might not be the right choice in understanding the outcome. If you want to see a little bit more of this, we have a review in Nature Nano in December um, that you could consult. Now, I won't spend much time on slide 13. It's uh, su sufficient just to say that if you look at the left-hand distribution, that's 100 nanometers polystyrene particles. And then if you expose those particles and spin them down, uh, for example, in human plasma, we dispersed them after six hours the dotted curves are still essentially unchanged. And that, that shift in size turns out to be due to what's absorbed onto the surface. And I show you this only to comment that those particles have been redispersed after they've been spun down, redispersed in PPS. So six hours later, that absorbed layer is, uh, hasn't moved. And if you go to the next, um, slide, that just shows you, I think, what many people already know, that it's easy to strip off those biomolecules that have been absorbed and analyze them. This is not a huge industry, by the way, so I, I don't want to go into details. The real point here is that um, if you actually look at what is absorbed to the surface as a function of, say, serum concentration, uh, then for many particles, what is absorbed changes depending on the concentration of uh, the serum that's been added. And here, here you see very clearly the context dependence of uh, our work. So depending on what you choose to disperse particles in, you'll get quite a different answer. And if you go to slide 15, you'll begin to see that in the upper left picture, this is the kinetics or time resolved picture of the amount of particles, these particular particles, that are taken into the cell as a function of time, with and without serum. And so the next point is pretty clear that um, and by the way, I'm focusing 
perhaps some very, very simple particles, but what I'm telling you is essentially true of all legacy, so to speak, so to speak OECD particles. So there's nothing special about these examples. Um, but this picture shows you very clearly that the amount that is taken into the cells is very dependent on the uh, protein environment, for example. And so the real dose, that is the dose that is experienced intracellularly, if I may use that word, real dose, it is dependent on what you disperse. Now, of course, we know it's also dependent on, for example, the degree of aggregation and things like that. But this is a different subject. This is even if they are well dispersed. You have quite different um, degree of uptake. And furthermore, you can actually look at the paper listed on the lower left, but you look at these two images on the lower right of slide 15, you will see that this is an example of silica um, with 549 cells. Again, the details are not particularly important. But you'll see that in the absence of serum and in the presence um, of sufficient serum, sufficient being um, a, a, a topic to which I'll return in a moment, not only do you get different uptakes, but you get different biology. And actually, those of you that have studied um, freshly prepared silica, in the absence of serum at sufficient concentrations, will have recognized, I think, a level of cell death. Now, the reason for this has got nothing to do with the silica, except nothing to do with the silica in a proper biological um, presentation. The, the, the cause of it is actually um, on the next slide, but I won't go into details, and probably we don't even really need to look at that slide. We could go directly to slide 17. Um, what we did in this case is, is interrogate the particles that had been exposed to cells, where indeed they caused degree of cell death in this case. And we find that possibly what should have been expected is that because particles typically have a very high avidity to take things from their environment, if you don't give them something that is reasonable, they'll take something else. And in this case, they've taken part of the cells. It's as simple as that. Um, and so if you like this corona that these particles form in the end, if you didn't give them enough serum, enough serum, they actually form a corona from the cells themselves. And that induces a fascinating cascade of biology none of which we think is likely to be relevant in realistic situations. Um, if you look at slide 18, I think it's sufficient for me to say that I think Chris is probably showing you these slides, and he has a talk on Friday, and I think it would be better to attend his talk if you want to see more details about that. Um, and then slide 19, I think, again, is something that you will be well aware of, or so many will be, that um, whatever kind of charges and so forth that one starts with, for example, these are aminated nanoparticles. Uh, when their particles are in the presence of proteins, they essentially that... Um, zeta potential or those exposed charges. In this case, usually we have something called overcompensation. So the sign of the charge actually reverses. And uh, so there's very little relationship between, um, between the bare particle and the particle in this context. And slide 20 shows you in this particular case that the degree of cell permeability or cell damage of these aminated particles depends essentially on the protein environment that we present to it. 
Now, if we go to slide 17, uh, just like what we have discussed, and do that, I'd, I'd ask you to take a step back with for a moment and ask how it got here. Why in in vitro experiments do we add 10% serum, for example? And the answer is very simple, to feed the cells. It's as simple as that. The second question is, why do we add, add fecal calf serum? And the answer is very simple, because it's cheap. And I use this as an example to show the dangers of importing without critical evaluation practices that have been taking place for many years successfully in in vitro toxicology. I think we need to beware of getting anything we want to get. I think if you think through what we've just discussed, you'll actually see the basis of a lot of disputes in the literature. You'll see the possibility, the potential for some people to find biological interactions, toxicity, and so forth, and others not to find, where in fact nobody is wrong. But perhaps really went wrong in this scenario is that we didn't think deeply enough about how to recreate in vitro experiments and make more closely the in vivo situation. In practice, it's hard to imagine that nanoparticles could ever present themselves to organisms or most parts of an organism unless they are in excess of a biological milieu fully covered. And most of these damage scenarios that I showed you, I think, are just not realistic. If we go to the next slide, I think... Um, <laughs> I've left this anonymous. Some of you may know uh, who said this. Um, I think it's true, but it's not exactly um, a desirable uh, reflection on us. And I want to discuss this issue as a second example of things that we need to look at. So if we go to the next slide, just remind us what a positive and negative control would look like in this particular context. So let's say that someone wanted to study in vitro um, apoptosis. In most experiments, we would use a positive control that we would know induces apoptosis, a negative one that we knows we know does not, and we would show our experiments bracketed by the positive control and the negative control, and people trust us because they also use the same positive control and the same negative control. In the case of apoptosis, it's in chemicals, often stars burn. And if we get the same result as the other person gets with stars burn, there's no reason to distrust us. Now, um, the question is, uh, do we have positive controls? And I think if you go to slide 24, the bottom line is no. Now, I want you to work with me a little bit on this one because this is a delicate point. Of course, you can, if you're studying apoptosis, you f can for sure, and you should, use star sperm as a control. But the question is whether it is a positive control for your study, which is nanoparticle-induced apoptosis. And there I want to um, explore this issue of mode of action. And what really <coughs> underlies a positive control deeply is the hope that your positive control has a similar mode of action. In other words, if it acts completely differently, um, to your experiment, 
it's essentially just says that you're able to do this experiment of stars one. It says nothing about whether your system is positively controlled by that mode of action. If you go to slide 25, I won't spend much time on this, but suffice to say that um, in the particles that we've been developing and looking at for apoptosis positive control, for example, there's a very clear mode of action that is in no way related, I think just skip slide 26 as well, that is in no way related to um, a chemical mode of action for apoptosis. And if you go to 27, furthermore, you will also see that in this particular case, um, positive controls are also affected again, as you might expect, by, for example, the amount of serum. In other words, how we present positive control. Again, this doesn't happen with stars born. In this particular case, we find that uh, proteins that are derived from the environment are carried into the cell, and the particles act like a Trojan horse, for example. They don't cause damage where you would expect them to, but in this more realistic environment, they reach new places in the cell where they then induce damage, they then induce another kind of signaling cascade, and that produces a very distinctive mode of action. And we can just think, skip also a slide 28, but just to um, pass through it at least, you can actually follow in these experiments the evolving location of the particles, the corona, that is the adsorbed proteins, um, their locations and the ultimate outcomes. These, uh, much of this work is published and uh, also Anna Salvati, who's probably close by, uh, can tell you a lot about this, this work. So coming now to slide 29, um, I suppose I showed you that because it justifies why we've been working so hard within Quality Nano to produce positive controls. And I think those of you that are closely associated with the program will know that we're trying to develop and roll out positive controls one by one for all the different endpoints. And we've started with uh, apoptosis. It's, it's the most trivial one. Um, and we've, we're launching that at this meeting and we hope to develop that over the coming months and make it available to all of the partners in Quality Nano and then beyond. Now I don't have time, I, I have to uh, draw my uh, talk to a close, so I don't have time to uh, go into this whole question in detail. But suffice to say that there are various workshops going on around the meeting connected to round robins, positive controls, and so forth. They have been announced and probably will be announced again. And I, I really would urge you to go to those meetings and get into all of this in more detail. We think it's important. And um, the, the other point I think I would like to make is that I don't want to leave you with the impression, for example, in the positive controls issue, that this is an easy or a completed task. Um, small details of the nanoparticle synthesis can still leave us with a different biological outcome. And so we still have these problems with batch to batch or reproducibility and many others. But still, please go to those workshops. Let's go to the last slide. Um, and I suppose that's really, if you want to forget all I've just said and remember a few simple points, these are they. Um, obviously, we in Quality Nano are committed to making this field work. We are committed to defending it, developing it, and explaining it to everyone, not just science, but ourselves, but also to policymakers, regulators, and funders. Now, I think my own personal belief is 
that there is a wind of change in this community. What started out as a loose and, and unstructured assembly of people is now beginning to converge to a very clear vision of itself. And I believe that that vision of itself will include uh, the desire to be seen by the rest of the church as just as good as you are. And increasingly, we'll wish face to face with the rest of the scientific community compete with that for the best places in peer recognition. Now, the other area I think that's changing is that nanosafety research has recognized, I think, its broader role. And um, I think it is seeking to govern itself. And I think that what's happening at this meeting uh, is, in fact, an example of it seeking to govern itself. And in the editorial of Major Nano, at the end, I think there's a very interesting statement. It says that this whole topic of quality that they're worried about will be discussed in Prague, which it is being, and that they will look forward to hearing the outcome. And so I think the outcome of this discussion will partly be determined by what you think. The last message I want to leave you with is that, as I said, this program uh, is seeking to support these two objectives. And, and it's open, and we want you to join us. And if you go to the last slide, that's just a tribute to some of the people that have been involved. And also, I would add to that, because I think it's an opportune moment, um, a tribute to my young colleague, Dr. Isot Lynch, who I'm happy to announce has uh, been uh, appointed in the senior position in the University of Birmingham. Uh, and uh, I'd like to pay tribute to all that she's been to us. And I'd also like to say that we expect the uh, average IQ in the University of Birmingham to increase by 50% at the end of the month. Now, I recognize in saying that, that that will probably be the last time I'll ever be invited to the University of Birmingham. But nevertheless, the uh, mission of Quality Nano is to tell the truth. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kenneth, for this talk, which was very well audible and also the scientific message was clear, I think. I'm sure there are many questions. Please wait until you have the microphone so that he can hear it well. There's one over there. And Michael, again, state who you are. My name is Hans Power from KIT Karlsruhe. Can you hear me, Kenneth? I can, but uh, go ahead and, and speak, Hans Power. It's not quite as clear as Michael was. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for pointing out the pitfalls of dosing of nanoparticles to cells. As you said, it's important to control the context when you do this. However, I have not really heard the cure. How would you control the context of a specific cell which has a specific protein content? Don't you have to avoid uh, the, the medium completely? Um, I think I, I'll try to answer the question I think you asked, Hans Bar, and uh, stop me if I got, heard the wrong question. I, I think the sense of your question was, should we leave out the medium, uh, because otherwise we can't control things. And actually, paradoxically, what I was trying to explain, that in these cases, and in fact in most, if you leave out the medium, uh, you get the worst possible scenario. Um, there is a very important uh, distinction that occurs when the medium is present. Um, in the case I showed you of silica, essentially the, the very high energy of the surface of the particles damages the surface of the cells, and the particles gain entry to the cell by a damage mechanism. They then go to different and uh, interesting places but as soon as you have um, enough uh, serum present in the medium, then you revert to conventional biological processes. 
Now let me deal with this question of what is enough. The reason I say enough is that if you add a very small amount, uh, and it's uh, small and large, by the way, is of course determined by the surface area of the sample of the nanoparticles, obviously. So a small surface area of nanoparticles uh, needs a smaller amount of serum and so on and so forth. But if you, if you add um, insufficient amount or zero, you have these damage processes that lead to nanoparticle imprints. Beyond a certain amount, you revert to a fairly conventional biological process. And at that point, um, at least you're back in the ball game. You're no longer going to produce silly results, where it's actually the high surface energy of the particle simply damaging the surface of the cell. At that stage, you come into another level of questions, which is what kinds of, of mediums should you have added? And of course, we do know a lot more about that now, but that's a much more sophisticated question. Succinctly put, you should try to match the medium with the biological target. Um, we shouldn't be using uh, FCS with human cells. We should be using human serum with human cells. Does that answer your question? Is that, did I understand your question, Hans Park? Hmm. Thank you for that question. Are there other questions? Um, I ask the people who have the question to come forward to this microphone, please. Um, maybe you can, it's better if you come to this microphone so that he can understand as well. And other questions that have questions to speed up a bit the uh, um, pause between the different questions that they come and line up already behind. Or at the microphone, yeah. then everybody can hear you. Uh, Massimo Massarini from University of Milano. And I can. Uh, I, I appreciated very much your talk, and uh, uh, I'm going directly to the to the question. I completely agree with you of the need to having positive or negative controls, and uh, just uh, going directly to the, your example, that one of apoptosis. Uh, I agree with you that you need positive controls, and that these controls are very importantly uh, to be chosen because they need to work and to have the same mechanism of action. Absolutely. Okay. Now I'm, I'm forgetting to be a nanomedical uh, scientist and to be originally a biochemist. And uh, as, uh, as far as I can tell, the mechanism to induce apoptosis in a cell are many, many, many. means that you can uh, act on the respiratory chain, you can act on the uh, lipids of the mitochondria, you can induce, uh, you can induce the, uh, oxidative uh, reactions and, and produce uh, these, these kind of, of uh, oxidations. Then you can uh, activate uh, caspases, you can uh, work on the, the distribution of lipids on the, on the, on the surface, like phosphatase serine and so on. So, uh, what I am worried, uh, how is it possible, but I agree with you, to have so many different nanoparticles uh, that act on these different, many different uh, pathways of the, of the uh, apoptosis? That's, uh, by the way, firstly, let me thank the person who oriented the camera, because I can now see you. Thank you for your question. It's it's really penetrating question, and it allows us to go to another level in the discussion. You're absolutely right. Um, in fact, it's clear by the very virtue of the very arguments that we've both made that a positive control that does not touch the same mechanisms is not a positive control for the study that you undertake. Therefore, in principle, we will need a different positive control 
for every nanoparticle-induced process that we find. Now, it's of interest to note that so far, to my knowledge, the, uh, the categories of nanoparticle-induced apoptosis are quite small. I won't go into the details of what they are, but the varieties of them have been quite small. Um, unlike, so far, um, the broader range of apoptotic mechanisms. Now, let me carefully resolve what I mean by that. One does see in these, uh, for example, crosstalk apoptosis processes, many uh, simultaneous uh, parts of the pathway will mean up, but they all start from a common source and a simple single mechanism. Uh, and, and we can go into that another time if you like. So my uh, belief at the minute is that what we've seen so far in these pathways is that for nanoparticles, one by one as we've looked at them, there is a, a catalog of mechanisms and that indeed it is not as broad a catalog yet as we have seen in chemicals. Um, but each time we find a new one in the catalog, we will indeed have to find another positive control. That's it. You're right. I think it's doable though. I don't think that there are our experience, at least so far, is that um, you know, nanoparticles tend to act in a, in a more narrow axis of uh, mechanism. Okay. Thank you, Kenneth. There is one more question. Uh, Bengt, if you get over there and you can... Kenneth can see you. Okay. Thank you, Kenneth, for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Um, just again to the point of positive controls I mean how can we know the mechanism before we conduct the experiment so so are we not in fact talking about reference materials rather than positive controls that's that's one one remark the, the other is that I would uh, to some extent of course I do agree with the previous uh, 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 colleague who posed the question that and, and, and stated that there are many pathways to induce apoptosis at, at, at on the other hand uh, the program does converge on common pathways, so I would argue that starosporin could be a positive control, if indeed by positive control we mean that we want to control the assay itself. But if we want to understand mechanisms, that, that's another question, and, 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 and again, uh, coming back to my first point, uh, I will not in fact talk about the need for reference materials in the field of nanotoxicology. Uh, very interesting question. Um, I mean, maybe let me try to interpret the question. Um, in a sense, positive control might be an earlier stage of uh, scientific exploration. So you might say that once you've sort of understood what the mechanism is, um, is it any longer a positive control? But is it really just a reference material? I think the three, the last two questions, and what we're discussing here, will probably converge to much the same uh, issues. And I don't want to um, take the position that, um, that this is resolved. But what I s stated before is that we have the feeling that there are bands of mechanisms, packages of pathways. And that these pathways are nanoparticle induced, and that many nanoparticles that induce that pheno general phenomenon act by a similar mode of action. Um, in this case, for example, lysosomal damage lies at the heart of it. Um, lysosomal damage of a certain type lies at the heart of it. And so it's possible along those lines to actually, uh, in, to actually have, if you like, a positive control for lysosomal damage. Whether we call them positive controls or reference materials, um, I'm not sure if that's important. But what will be important 
is that people who don't want that study um, apoptosis of this general class or cell cycle arrest of the classes that are now emerging and all of the other mechanisms, that we do have some means of exchanging acts of trust between us and the lab. Whether we call them positive controls or reference materials, I don't know. But I also want to re-stress that this is far from a finished concept. Nor are these materials in any way complete. What I'm arguing in a sense is to go back to that anonymous quotation. Nano safety is uh, one of the few areas of modern science that lacks common use of a positive or negative control. And I don't think that we can afford to wait any longer to take action. So let's at least go closer to a situation where we do have positive and negative controls. Let's see them in the literature. Where they are imperfect or imprecise or they don't mimic closely enough the mechanism, let's say so. But let's, let's get the process moving. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Kenneth, for these uh, um, responses to the different questions. I think we had a very uh, interesting discussion afterwards. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank you again for having joined us uh, via camera. The quality of sound and video was excellent. And uh, after all this discussion on positive and negative control particles, we should not forget that uh, Q-nano, quality nano as it's called now, is also a lot about transnational access. We have the best facilities across Europe providing their lab space uh, through these TA access uh, funding opportunities. So you can access, you can deposit your requests to access those facilities. And if you get grant, a grant, you have free travel, free housing and free access and on-site uh, support for running your additional research questions that you have. And I want to raise your attention to the TA clinic tomorrow at, uh, in the afternoon, but don't just trust for that TA clinic. It might be busy. You might not get enough time. So con check outside on the counter the, the flyers, the handouts on what TA possibilities exist. Contact QNano staff to direct you to the right people to discuss what do these facilities offer, what are possibilities, and get our help in writing a good grant application for this TA access. We had in the past a lot of rejection rates, and many of them we think were good science, but not sufficiently well packaged. And it's just a shame if, if we reject your proposal just because we didn't get your idea. And with this last part, again, thank you to all the speakers of this session. And uh, our coffee break goes until 11.30. And we start in here at 11.30. And thanks so far for this good timing and off for coffee break. Thanks, Kenneth. So it's the microphone is right here, so...